right, bit of a changed setup. It's great that so many of you found the way up here. And uh, another one of those persons that actually probably don't need an introduction. Roland has been on stage a lot in the last years and is, is well known in the community. He has done a lot to make life easier for integrators and editors with creating documentation and videos and examples on GitHub and is also a dancer from Vienna. So what more can you, ha can you want? Um, I guess let's welcome Roland on stage. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, all right. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you that you're here. I want to talk today about how your life can be easier in Neos projects by mastering node types. Not just when you first build a website, when, but when you maintain it over years and years and years. So my goal is that this one is the one talk you need to master node types. So we'll go through all the features for how you can use Neos node types to make your life easier. And I aim for a no bullshit approach. Often I'll not explain why I do it. I'll show you things how to do it. Feel free to ask me later for some reasons. Last year I gave a talk about how to make intuitive editing interfaces for, uh, for, for content editors. We had talks for designers, for um, product managers, but this will be a talk only for developers. I want to make this only about development and how to have easy to use node types and easy to maintain and further develop node types. So a typical project starts like this and then over time the complexity gets crazy and crazy. You have node types and they grow and grow and then there are unintended side effects because this node type only works in this node type with these conditions and it gets harder and harder to refactor and to reason about. Um, the goal should be that the 20th node type is as easy to make as the 10th or 12th node type. So to achieve this, we'll talk about how and when to use document node types, um, when you can delegate some, some responsibility to an API, and just a show of hands, how many of you are regularly integrating APIs to get data? All right, all right. And um, we'll talk about how and when to create content node types. And these are a bit more complicated. We'll spend more time on that. And then in the end, we'll see how we can reuse most of the logic and abstract it away. Um, and we'll see how we have a node type with 97 lines of code and in the end, the node type has 17 lines of YAML code. All right, so why should you listen to me? Um, I, just a brief introduction. I'm working in an Austrian agency. We specialize on NEOs only. Um, we're regularly winning some awards and make some websites for billion dollar companies. I'm in the NEOs core team since 2018, and I'm really, really in in love with the whole system. Um, all right, so let's go into it. Let's start with the simple ones. Why do you want to have a document node type? The easy first answer is you want to have a site which is available under a specific URL. That's the most obvious case where you want to have that. I would recommend every time you make a new project, make an abstract page and put all your generalized not uh, logic in there. So this definitions for the styles, for the scripts, some head tags, um, put all of that in an abstract node type. And then you will probably want to start by having some general use case node types, like a page with a hero image, a page with a hero text, hero video, something like that. Make sure that the hero element is a, a part of the document node. The big advantage is, Every page needs to have some kind of header. And 
a hell should be only on a page once, and there should be only one H1 tag on a page. If you put it on the document node, you just have that. And uh, then, if you want to make it easy for editors, you can create specific document node types targeted for use cases. So you can have one which is called landing page, and it then includes a, a template script where you, where you basically just define some default content. So when the editor creates a new document, they have some default content, and they just fill or change it. Um, let's not go so much into that. One tip, which is very important, don't use those generic node types all the time. Um, if you compare the left and the right side, on the left side we just have a, a bunch of page documents, and on the right side we have specific use cases, like a block overview page, a blog post, and a blog tag. And then, if one year later you want to write a migration, it's way easier to target the right side here, because the the point of it is already part of the name, and so you can just target those documents to write migrations, or extend it, or change the header look of all your blog posts, which will be very hard on the left side. Now, right now, the last one is, in some cases, you want to have some content which is created by editors and can be referenced and used in other cases but you want to have it only in the back end. And the part of the near skeleton is one mix-in which is called backend only. You basically apply it on a document, um, and then the editors can see it, and uh, the editors can see it, the editors can edit it, um, but in front is not, not visible. For a, a simple example is you have a block, and you want to have a block author, but you don't want to have a blog author page where it's just like, oh, this is the author. But you can still have that as a document node in the backend and then use it so the author gets filled in automatically. Uh, the Fusion implementation for this is pretty straightforward as well. It's just on the root in the backend, it's only visible. Okay. Um, and so in the backend, it's just a black page, similar to how you create a, a shortcut page, and in the front it's not reachable. This is... <laughs> um, all right, so that was all introduction so far. It's probably something everybody of you has seen or used in, in typical projects. I want to mention one thing which is um, about how to use APIs. One concept which is very important is, if you integrate APIs, there should be one source of truth. So either you use an API and all your editors change content, create content, delete content on this other platform, or everything is in Neos and they consume your API. But you should never make it possible that content can be changed in Neos and outside of Neos. It gets a mess. So there must always be one single source of truth. And then, if you integrate an API, you can basically don't care about how content is managed, updated, and that kind of thing. You just have an API and you just get the data. There are two approaches of how you can integrate that. One is a more transient way, where you just pull in the data and then render it, or the other one is a more persistent way. So you can use an eel helper, and in the eel helper you have a get request or something similar to get data, and then you just render it out. And then you leverage our normal fusion caching for caching the content. You can have an action controller, and then just offer that as a JSON endpoint. So you have a few application, and it queries your endpoint to, to get the data in a nicely structured format. And then you can use um, the object caching for making sure that this is not queried every time you open uh, the link. Or you can use a more persistent approach where you sync your node types. So you get the external API, and you create um, node types out of that. 
and then you have some kind of command controller which syncs it and creates it all the time. Now, for this, make sure that these node types are not editable and that they can't be created or deleted by the users. This gets a mess. So single source of truth. There should be only one way of changing content. And a small side tip, if you have an API where the transforming of the data and maybe augmenting is very expensive, you can always um, save a content hash from what you got from the API to make sure that most of your updates are fast. So that's a whole another talk. Um, we'll skip over that because we're here for node types. And the most interesting node types are content node types. They have a lot of complexity, um, which is not covered in normal note, document node types. So I want to start by showing you how another system does it. Um, this is Webflow. I believe Webflow has an amazing UI. And the cool thing is you can do everything you can do in CSS. You can define grid layouts, you can define paddings, you can define mobile responsive behavior, everything. And so why is not every editor just using this? A simple question is it's fucking hard. Look how many elements you just need to have this text plus image thing. And editors have to figure out how to create all of these things they have to think about responsive behavior, like on mobile, I want to have the image above the text. On desktop, they might be on the left or on the right side. It's a lot of thing to think about. And in this case, the editor has to think it and still create great content. Um, in Neos, we want to take care of that by ourselves. And so this is why it's hard, because we have to think about the use cases and make good abstractions based on that. So my first tip is keep your node types simple. So if you would build something like we have seen in, in Webflow, it would look something like this. And then the editors create these kind of structures. And then in a year, you want to change your grid layout. And you have to write migrations for this. And you basically, you're fucked there. There's no chance to get this done. Um, if you, on the other hand, have something like this, where there's just a one column and a two column text. It's very easy to write migrations for that. It's very easy to ex uh, change the layout options on that. So they are more predictable and they're more maintainable for you as a developer. And they incorporate all the responsiveness logic, like putting the image above or below on the right and everything. So you don't have to offer so many configuration options for editors typically because you can abstract it away to best case, uh, like to good use cases. Um, so the complexity of node types comes from two things. The one is, uh, well, the overall problem is slicing up the UI is hard. The one thing is what kind of layout proper properties do you want to give to your editors? Um, so to get them right is difficult. The other thing is, you maybe haven't noticed yet, but there are content node types and they play different roles in our layout. And it wasn't obvious so far which element plays what kind of role. So to think about that is really complicated and there's a big chance you add, end up like this. You have strategy A, you have strategy B, and analyzing whether strategy A or B is more efficient. <laughs> um, I've done probably a bit too much of that. So from now on, I call my strategy just A, which I'll show you. Um, we have two types, of, we have two kinds of node types. We have node types which are of type section, and we have ones which are of type block. So what do we mean with that? Section node types take the whole horizontal width of the element, so they span to the left and to the right. They themselves care about the container layout, so how big the element can get, and they have a space to the bottom. So this would be a section node type. And then inside some sections, you might allow block elements. And a block element can be something like the text here. So the text just takes whatever space it gets. And inside that, it just makes sure there's a configurable space to the bottom. 
the same for the image. You have the image and a space below. And that way, you have block elements. And you can put them in different ways of sections, and you can just create content. Now, we want to move we want to have a similar logic in our presentation comp components, so in Monocle. And in Monocle, typically, you have um, three kinds of um, layouting um, objects. You have one which I call section, and a section is really a section tag. It can have an ID, it can have paddings, uh, margins, and in that, we put a container layout. The container layout is something all of you know, this kind of like thing which makes send, uh, makes sure that the text doesn't get too wide on big screens and that it keeps a minimal padding on mobile. This is a container. And then we have a layout. Right, I have some. So this is a section. Um, a container is the thing which like narrows the content. And then we have layouts which are something like this where you have like these four, four columns. And they are probably different objects for you for different kind of layouts. Now let's compare if you create a text section and a text block. A text section would start by having a section element with probably a configurable space below. Probably then inside that you have a container, which is a default container thing, and inside that you put the content. On the other hand, if you have a text block which can be put in a section, it just renders a text and has a space below. Now, the, so now, typically, we have maybe for bigger projects 30 to 50 uh, section node types, and then you have like 5 to 10 um, block node types. So let's go into the code. How would, you, how would we do that? First, we define constraints. So there are two constraints. The one is this is a section, and the other one, this is a block. Uh, we just create abstract node types. And then in our abstract page, in the main content collection, we only allow sectional types, because everything else would look weird in our content. Now, the cool thing after we have done that is every time we create a new node type, we only need to add this one line, either constrained content block or constrained content section. And just by defining this one line, you get all the logic around where is it allowed to be used and how can it be used. All right, so if we start by writing our text section, that's quite a lot of code. Um, this is why the first node type typically is, a, is quite big. Um, so let's take a look at it. it is. We have our text section. It already has this text section constraint. Um, then it has some logic of how it's shown to the editor. So it's called text. It's in the general group. And in inspector, we have a layout group. Now, the first thing we really allow to be configurable is the container width. And here I have two examples. The container width can be small or can be medium. The next thing, um, it we have a space below, and this can be nothing or very big. So we can have a few options here. And then we might have something like a section ID. So on a long page, you can scroll to this block by having a section ID set. And then the actually important thing, you can define some free text. Now, we said a uh, text section would look like this in pseudocode. Now let's make real code out of it. So we would have a fusion object, uh, which is called text section. You see, I always group this in, my, in the same content folder. So I have a text, and then I might have a variation text section or text block. And this text section, of course, has a renderer where it creates a section. Now, this is the presentational component section, and that probably has an ID and some space below, so we need those properties. And then inside that, we have a container, which has a container width, so we need that. And then inside that, that's the unique thing. This is how we're rendering the actual text. So we want to remove a lot of 
this not unique thing and abstract it away so that our node types actually become clear about their specific purpose or their specific use case. So from all of this long thing, let's start at the top. Um, there's an inspector group layout, which is something you'll use in probably almost every node type, or every content node type at least. So it doesn't make sense to have it here. We make a mix in, uh, which just defines this inspector group. And then we create an override content YAML where we put it on all content nodes as inspector option. Now, the next thing is this container with. So we also make a mix on in out of that, which we call mixing container. And in there, we have this option container with. Now, for this first node type, this is not so interesting. But imagine you have like 10 node types. It's very clear that the container mix in just adds this container with. And if a designer half a year later figures out, oh, we need a third container with, they add it. And it consistently across all your node types, there's this new option, which is there in all places, not just in one place, which would be very weird. We do the same thing with the space below. Um, now, the space below, I like to create this as a presentation component, because I believe that this is part of the design, of the front-end design, and not part of the integration. So there is a helper space below. And basically, it, on the left side, it takes the values. On the right side, it creates some spacing classes. Um, yeah, so my presentation manages consistent spacing. We can use this in blocks. We can use this in sections. We can use this in many different places. And our spacing is consistent. Now, um, these classes here are Tailwind classes. If you don't know them, basically are just classes which define, in this case, a margin bottom of 12 sp spaces. Um, and on bigger screens, they increase. You can put whatever you want there. Now, we still want to make a, a mix in. Um, so you notice here, it's in the, in the same folder as our YAML. So inside mix in space below, we have a YAML and we have a Fusion. And the Fusion just gets a CSS class matching space below and has a, a useful um, fallback that's very helpful. Now, this blinking is a bit annoying. Um, now we want to create a presentation component for the section. Um, our, sorry, I got out of it. Um, anyway, we want to create a presentation component for our section. Now, the real code will look different based on each of your projects. Um, in our case, we just want to have an ID. We want to have a space below. And of course, we want to have some real content. Now, then we take this space below and we transform it to some CSS classes using the helper, which we already created. And then we render it as a section tag with an ID, some classes, and content inside. Now, some of you maybe wondered what this private thing is. That's a new feature from Neos 8.3. So if you have content and you want to transform it and then render it, you can put it in this private props place. All right. Um, to make it a bit more useful, we still want to have some kind of general API for classes where you can put extra CSS classes. And then we will use that and merge them all together in our private class, where we have some base classes, like that the element should use up the full width. Then we have these custom classes, and then we add the space below. So that's pretty straightforward so far. And we need to change the class here. Since section is one of the things you will use a lot in your presentation, I would recommend to make this really, really clean. So we have, a, st we have a, our, a style guide definition where we have some example content in it. And then we create prop types where we define the API, so what kind of options are allowed. 
This makes it super easy later on to, to find typos. Maybe you typed, I don't know, space below wrong, you, you made a wrong character or something, and Fusion will tell you, like, eh, there's something wrong. So the, the presentation components, which you use a lot, it makes sense to use prop types. Now, let's use this mix-in. Basically, before we had our presentation section with an ID and space below, and we still have to query this data from, from the node, and we now can just use our, oh no, sorry. <laughs> uh, we, we now create our section mix-in. So we said a section has a section ID, which we define here, and it has a space below where we already have our mix-in, so we can put that together. And uh, that's our space uh, section mix-in. Um, if you want to do something like a section ID in production use cases, this is a quite naive implementation. There's a code queue jump markers plugin, which is very helpful um, for doing that and offers some, some features around that. Now, we create the same way we did it with space below, we now create a mix in section. And the mix in gets the section ID, gets space below and puts all of that in our presentational component. This doesn't look like a lot of code, but this is a mix-in you'll use in like 50% of your node types. And so just a few lines of code save you a lot over time. And now we can reduce that by instead of having this, we just have our mix-in section, right? So, the same way we make a container, a mixing container, it takes the container with and puts it in the presentation container. Um, something some of you might notice, I'm using the, the same names for properties and for mix-ins. So I have a mix-in container and the properties always start with container. And I have a mix-in section and the properties Names always start with section, that's why it's section ID. And here is container, this is why it's container ID. So when you add multiple mix-ins, you never have conflicts because you follow this naming convention. Now we can also use the container, and now this code, while it's just a few lines less, I believe it's so much clearer what it does. It has a section, it has a container, and the thing that makes this node type special is this line of code. We are rendering text, and we are getting this kind of text. And now imagine you make a text with image, or you make a two-column text or something. It's very clear what's unique and what are general use cases of your layout system. All right. Now we started with um, the text section, we removed quite a lot and moved it into super types. Now there's this one big thing still, which is our text inline configuration of what kind of things we allow. So we don't allow H1, because there should be only one H1 on a page. We allow all these other headlines, we allow tables, lists, and so on. And this is also very repet repetitive. And I've seen it in many projects that this is hard-coded in the node types, and you have to figure out what, what's actually the important thing, what's the thing which repeats all the time. Now, uh, there's a, a Neos, I believe, 7 dot something feature called Node Presets, and it allows you to define like typical use cases for your project. So you might want to allow tables in all your text, or you don't want to allow it. And based on your design system, you can define some default ways and you put it in a settings.notepresets.yaml and typically I define uh, something which is called play, text plane. So in text plane I can write text but I can't add any formatting. Then there is a text title where I can have different title tags but I cannot create tables or links or lists or whatever. And then there's this free one which allows the editor to do quite a lot, right? Now, our text section is really simple. And imagine 
you didn't work on the project. You come one year later and you see this. It's very clear what it does, right? And which is very different from the file we saw in the beginning with uh, 97 lines. It's just so much clearer to understand what's the purpose of this and why it's unique. Now we have our text section. Let's create a text block note type. This is actually really simple. It's just a few lines of code. In this case, we don't have a section mix in, we don't have a container mix in. We just have our space below. It's of type block, and then it has some free text. And notice, in the UI part, I'm using the same configurations here and in our section, which makes it easier for editors to understand, ah, I, I know this note type, it's a similar thing. And they already kind of expect that if you put something into a container layout that it wouldn't create another container layout. So with this, you have a consistent way of making sure that this works and is predictable for your editors. All right, and then the text block is also very simple to integrate. To integrate. We get our space below class, uh, we get the text, and we put both into some kind of rich text presentation and component. Um, now, now imagine, I just showed you a few very, very common mix-ins, but there are many more use cases, and you'll notice, sorry, uh, and, and, and you'll notice that over time, you can put like 70, 80% of your YAML logic into mix-ins and then reuse it across different node types. So something which I often have is a mix-in called section.backgroundcolor, and I make this on, like, specifically as a separate mix-in, so I can cr add a mix-in section, and I might add a mix-in uh, section.background. So if I want the editor to allow it on this node type, I add it, if not, I don't add it. And my, my integration just sees if there's a property, if so it uses it, otherwise it doesn't use it. Other use cases are in most layout systems you have some kind of call to action buttons. They're actually links, but they look like a button. So I started to call them button link to make clear that it's a link, but it kind of looks like a button. And similar, in, in a similar fashion, we have this button link, which has a label and has a target. But then, in some cases, maybe I want to have different types of button, like, oh, this is the primary look, this is the secondary look. And if the editors should be able to choose it, I add this mix-in. All right, so I have one last tip. If you create block um, presentation components, which we want to use as block, you can leverage container queries. This is a CSS spec, and it's actually integrated in browsers. So instead of defining responsive behavior based on the size of the screen, you can define responsive behavior based on the specific um, element you're designing. And so if you put it in a bigger place, it behaves differently than if you put it in a smaller space. So you can have the same. Um, text block element, and if it's in a three-column layout, it ha uses a bit of different um, spacing than in a four-column layout. Now, the way you would use that is for you, you make mobile first. So you first design how the component would look in a mobile layout, and then the cool thing is in all important desktop browsers, this is already supported, so you see all the bloom. Um, so you just define then these con container queries, and they work on desktop. And on mobile, you don't have to work, because on mobile, you have the mobile first layout. All right, so I talked uh, about a lot of different things. Um, document node types should have always an abstract page. They should include the hero and the h1 inside the document node type. And it's good that you have many different document node types. They make it later clearer for you what's going on. We talked shortly about API integrations with the biggest point that there should be always a single source of truth and that you have different approaches how to get the data. You can use eel helpers, you can use action controllers, or you can sync the nodes in your system. 
Um, then we said that content node types can have two main types, sections and blocks. And in your presentation system, you want to have something like section, container and layouts. And in a presentation, it really depends on what the designer thinks up. So maybe the names here change a bit. All right, that was a lot. Um, questions? Yes, questions. We do, in fact, have questions. Our esteemed uh, audience, actually two people um, are, I want to say, politely critical mm -hmm. of one of your suggestions. Um, I'm just going to put these two questions together. They ask, why do you feel the need to provide such detailed control over vertical and horizontal flow and spacing to editors? Why not rely on predefined layout constraints to ensure a homogenous layout? Um, there's a very, it's, it depends on content. It really it depends. Le, 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 no, no, it doesn't depend on coding, it depends on content. Let's say you write a blog post and you write some text and then you have an image and below that you have some more text. If the image really closely belongs to the text you wrote above, you want to have a small space to make clear that, oh, this is the thing which belongs, like this is the chart for the thing I just explained in text. If you start a new section or something, you want to have a bigger space. And just by the difference of if the image is white or black, you might want to have different spacings. If you have a chart which has the page layout and just in small lines shows something, the spacing will be different than if you have some kind of like, I don't know, 3D avatar image. It will need more space. So I think editors need that option. Interesting. Um, what is your opinion of composition versus inheritance in node types? Wouldn't it be more flexible to use a property preset for the spacing property instead of a mix-in? Uh, property preset. In some cases, I use node presets for layout options where I have, I don't know, image fits and it can be contain or, or cover. Um, I typically put these in node presets. But in this case, I'm bundling configuration in YAML and rendering in Fusion. Yeah, I and. Huh? I asked that question. I didn't know what your aim was. Ah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I Well, mixing is not exactly the same as just like one inheritance layer. So I think it works pretty good. We have some big websites which we have over many years, and I'm happy with that concept. OK, next question. How do you place multiple buttons of the same type to the same node type? Uh, we had that conversation. I don't there apparently is a package which allows you to use multiple mix-ins and it just prefetches it. I don't... Voila. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the, next, the last question that, I mean, let me refresh real quick before I lie. The last question is not exactly verbose. Um, so if it's not entirely clear, maybe the person that asked it might elaborate a little bit. The question is, why not internationalization? <laughs> it's three words and two numbers. Because it's presentation of production code. <laughs> um, I mean, I could create you YAML configuration and always it just says E18N and it's hard to understand for you guys what the thing is doing. So that's why I wrote out things in one language. That's it for the questions. Thank you.